Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Good evening, everybody. Bill Zam here. Welcome to our weekly Wednesday show, Surrounded by Idiots, here on the Freedom Talk Radio 2013 Network. Today, of course, is September 11th, 2013, and it is a day that uh, we mark with... Um, remembrances and uh, storytelling and um, tributes to the people that perished on this day. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to start the show off with right off the top. First of all, here in southeastern Michigan, we um, yesterday we were at 100 degrees. Today we were at uh, around 95 to 97 degrees. Over the next 12 hours, our temperatures are going to drop 40 degrees and thus we have a line of major thunderstorms moving toward my location right now. So you may hear static, we may go off the air if we lose power, but fear not, we have the battery banks and the inverters all powered up, ready to go at a moment's notice, and um, we may actually get back on the air if that happens. Now, tonight only, what I am doing is I have on the video side over at ussamichigan.com, I am running that with the audio tonight. It is a full 128-bit stereo audio stream tonight, tonight only. Because the opening that I have for tonight just simply must be heard in uh, stereo to really appreciate it. Blog Talk, um, if you're watching on, on Blog Talk, the audio and the music and whatnot will not come over very well. So I'm just going to go ahead and kill a couple of seconds while people are closing the blog talk tab and opening up another tab and going to ussamichigan.com and clicking the red link at the top of the page. It says a video stream here. Uh, the video stream is at the bottom of the page. So while you guys are doing that, I am going to read my little prepared statement that I have for the opening. Um, September 11th, for me, as I suspect for you, is a very difficult day. Pardon me while I do a couple of things here. Okay, there we go. Pardon the unprofessionalism. September 11th is a very difficult day for me, as I suspect it is for many of you. Regardless of what happened or what you believe about that terrible day, for just a few days and weeks, we all came together as Americans once more. I have prepared a two-minute introduction for tonight's show, as I do on every September 11th. For my own sanity and benefit, I really need to play this. And I apologize to the audience and my guest tonight for its length, but I'll be back right after we play it. And on the video stream, you are going to see um, a slideshow of a 115th scale New York Fire Department fire truck, uh, unit number one. The audio that you're going to hear is from unit number one as it went towards the World Trade Center. So I am going to queue up the slideshow and I am going to play that now and I will be back in just a few minutes. We just had a, a plane crash into the upper floor of the World Trade Center, transmit a second alarm and start relocating companies into the area. The World Trade said that tower number one is on fire. The whole outside of the building was just a huge explosion. Engine one out, World Trade Center 1060. Send every available ambulance, everything you got to the World Trade Center now. Grace, how sweet the sound that a wretch like me. It appears an airplane crashed into the World Trade Center. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now. The first 
military and trans unit that it looked like it was intentional and more, more, more units going into the box. It could be a terrorist attack. Thank you for your indulgence while I did that. Um, every year, I do a September 11th um, sound file that I create. And every year, I promise myself this is the year I won't cry. But sadly, it's not the case. At any rate, I've been thinking over the past hours since I sent these show notes to our guest tonight about what we should talk about during our short time together. All the questions that I have about Ronald Reagan, national security, what she thinks about what is happening in our country, and most of all, today, September 11th. And I came up with this in the end. Today is not a day that we should stop what we do. Today is not a day to shut everything down, or as some suggest, a day of service. Today is a day that we remember. We remember what they what they wanted was to shut us down. Our enemies wanted that. Today is a day where we need to remember how we felt on those days after the terrible events of September 11th. The feeling of unity, the feeling of pride in being Americans that we had. We remember, we need to remember how we felt then. We need to remember those days when we all asked each other, are you okay? We need to remember what we felt that we felt unified in purpose. For that unity of purpose is something that some are trying to take away from us. I remember those days after September 11th when driving down the road, I saw a fire truck with lights and sirens blazing for the first time after all those people died. I remember driving down US 12 here in Saline, Michigan, and seeing that truck coming towards me. I remember the feeling I had, the pride of those firefighters as I pulled over to the side of the road and let them by so they could go and save lives. I remember that I got out of my car in respect for those men and seeing every single other driver also doing the same thing. We all got out of our cars that day and trucks to pay respect to our heroes in that fire truck that day. Every day I promise myself that this year I will not cry, that I will not feel the pain anymore. And then I realize that I need to feel the pain to remember and re pay respect to all of you, my fellow Americans, and the people that listen to this show. And that's my opening statement. And what I'm going to do right now is I am going to bring in our guest. and turn her microphone live. Pardon me, as usual, I'm running four computers here in the studio, so I had to pick up the microphone. 
Now, for the past, past few days, I have been preparing for the show, which has proven to be one of the most difficult of my career behind or in front of a microphone. This date has affected me more than it probably should have. We're also going to talk about someone that I cared very deeply for, our 40th president, Ronald Reagan. You see, here on September 11th, we remember and honor those people that perish that day and those people that serve us. I have been spending hour after hour after hour with Ronald Reagan through his speeches and writings over the past few days. And here is what I have come up with. On this show, what we're going to do is we're going to play Ronald Reagan clips and learn how right he was, what he saw coming in this country that is happening right now, how his words speak across all of these years, all of these decades to us, and how nothing has changed at all. The same people that were trying to push us into a socialist state are still doing the same thing even now. But what made Ronald Reagan so different than us? I believe that I know what it is. The people that were born and grew up during the Depression in the early 20th, 20th century had a different outlook on life, shaped by their experiences, just as all of us do. I have known in over my 55 years of life, many of them, and to a person, they took life and their work very seriously, but they reveled in the joy of being alive and in a prosperous time. Their talents, abilities, and contributions to our world cannot be understated and at the same time not very well understood, for we have not walked in the shoes of soup lines of the devastation of the First World War and into the dark specter of the Second World War. And now I'd like to welcome in our guest for the night. She was actually a White House staff member during the Reagan administration. Her name is Karna Small Bodman, and she is on the phone line with us right now. Karna, good evening, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Bill. I'm delighted to be with you today on this very important day of remembrance, as you have just indicated. Great to be here. Thank you. And how did my little opening monologue sound? It was that, uh, did I hit the nail on the oh, head? Boy. Did I get even close? Well, it, it brought back a lot of memories, and if I could just add one, uh, one personal note there that uh, came to mind as I was listening to you. Mm -hmm. uh, on that day, we all remember where we were. There's no question we all know. Uh, I happened to be in Florida that day, whereas I should have been in Washington, but I had gone down there for a meeting. But in any event, my son was, at that time, he had a job as a sales manager for a company, and he had called a staff meeting for 8.30 in the morning on the 56th floor of the World Trade Center. The day before, he had an opportunity to make a sales call over in New Jersey. Well, he's a consummate salesman, and he wouldn't turn that down. So he told the staff, he said, you guys, don't come in the office on September 11th. Go out, make some sales calls, sell some goods. We'll meet at 3.30, and uh, I'm going to go over to New Jersey and make that call. And so they were not on the 56th floor of the World Trade Center that fateful morning. However, I will say that it wasn't until 6 o'clock that night that we got word that the secretary got out safely. Wow. That was our family story. Wow. Um, all I can say Amazing. to that is praise be to God. There exactly. Were, there were so many people that day that should have been there that weren't. I have uh, heard stories well, over and I know. over. Th that's true. The only trouble is he uh, uh, lives does live over in New Jersey, and nine friends of theirs, fathers, uh, from, you know, the tennis group or the soccer group or whatever, fathers of uh, kids that they knew uh, perished uh, at that time. Oh Nine my. families that were friends. So it has a uh, very personal meaning to you, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. However, uh, as you said, we, we move along, we, we remember, and we, we make uh, promises to ourselves that we will, we will remain strong as a country, that we come together. Uh, we honor those who served, especially the firemen. Boy, were they terrific, and the policemen. i got to agree with you on that one. And uh, we, um, you know, we try to remain a strong nation and a beacon to the world, uh, which, of course, these 
jihadists don't like, and they will continue to be after us. Now, that also brings to mind that uh, today is the first anniversary of the Benghazi attack. Yes. And there's been a lot of talk about that on television. Of course, people probably have their TV sets on most of the day. But just to take a quick moment here, um, let's, let's reflect that it's been one whole year since our ambassador and three other brave Americans were killed, murdered that day. And actually, the first time an ambassador has been killed in something like 30 years. And, and, and let's see, what, what's happened uh, in that year? Nothing. Well, we've had five House panels, an internal investigation, and so forth, so far. Nobody's been arrested. Nobody's been fired or held accountable. The communication between the families of the victims and the State Department, the White House, now is almost non-existent, even after they promised, oh, we're going to get to the bottom of this, we're going to you know, arrest everybody, we're going to really be on top of this, we will not waver. In fact, let me see, oh yeah, here's a quote from Obama the day after the, that attack. He told the country, we'll not waver in our commitment to see that it, there's been justice for this terrible act. Yeah, right. Now, um, last month, Federal prosecutors did file the first uh, criminal charges related to the attacks, but okay, they filed them, but no, no arrests have been made or, you know, anything like that. I mean, it's it's unconscionable. All these things have been going on, and there are a lot of other things too. Uh, for example, our Secretary of State John Kerry uh, actually absolved four State Department employees who had previously uh, been removed. You probably remember from their jobs. Uh, for, you know, problems uh, regarding Benghazi. But, uh, you know, they just kind of moved into another job, so then they weren't really responsible, and you know, for security failures and so forth. And uh, the Senate, the House has been on this as, as, like an attack dog if they can, but it's been tough to get witnesses. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee is yet to even, even schedule a hearing with the survivors or anything. So... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this this is a really bad mark on the administration, and particularly on Hillary Clinton. And I hope to heaven that we can get somehow to the bottom of it. I hope so too. I uh, read an article yesterday that um, there are now credible threats against the whistleblowers that uh, have tried to come I, out. Can you imagine? I mean, come on. That That's is. Ridiculous. I don't even know what word to put on something like that. That is just... I know. That is just... I know. Unbelievable. So, uh, I, I don't think this would have happened uh, in Reagan's day, let me put it that way. <laughs> I, mean, they, I don't think so either. It happened, and they were dogged to try to get after the folks that uh, committed crimes and so forth. But in any event, uh, we are where we are. Yes, we are. Well, let me see. Do I have a Reagan clip that addresses that? Why, by golly, I just happen to have a Reagan clip right here. If you don't, well, there you this go. program, I promise you, will pass just as surely as the sun will come up tomorrow. And behind it will come other federal programs that will invade every area of freedom as we have known it in this country. Until, one day, as Norman Thomas said, we will awake to find that we have socialism. And if you don't do this, and if I don't do it, one of these days, you and I are going to spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Did you, were you able to hear that okay? Yes, I did. And, um, boy, I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> I mean, you play any of those clips, you know, and it really uh, brings, it, brings it back. And he, he talks about when he said when men are, were free, um, you know, we toss that term around a lot here. Oh, you know, this is a, a free country, isn't it? You know, people say that all the time. Uh, yes, we hope it is. Uh, we trust that it is. However, uh, and I know you'll probably want to get into this a little bit later, and I don't want to belabor it at this point, but there's a lot of talk today uh, with all the Syrian uh, headlines uh, about Russia. And, oh, we're going to cooperate with Russia, and we're going to, we're going to trust them to, to have uh, negotiations and they're going to take care of things. So let, let's just think about putting Syria aside for a second. Let's think about Russia. It's not free as a matter of, at, at all in terms of philosophy, if you want to think about it, or having things in common with this country. As a matter of fact, last time I looked, it's ranked on a par with Algeria 
for Political Rights and Civil Liberties. Uh, 79 journalists have been killed in Russia since 1992, more than any other country. They send people to um, London and other places to uh, assassinate opposition leaders. People that disagree with them, they throw them in jail on trumped-up charges. Uh, you know, these are the people we're going to negotiate with to, uh, you know, try to bring peace in the world. Good luck. Yeah, it, exactly. But uh, Putin can bend um, frying pans in his bare hands. <laughs> we got that going for us. <laughs> right. right. And, I, and I, ha- I, have to, I have to throw this out there because I have heard uh, Rush Limbaugh say it. At least Putin doesn't ride a girly bike. <laughs> <laughs> And wear mom jeans. Well, I mean, look. I'm sorry. That that was. If we're talking about negotiating something, whether it's a trade agreement, whether it's a missile defense agreement, whether it's a Syrian agreement, whether it's a a cyber warfare agreement, whatever it is, look who you've got in the ring, if you will. You've got the former head of the KGB versus a, a Chicago community organizer. A Chicago street street thug, basically. I mean, that's that well, Chicago thug. You know, I mean, Chicago. Po- well, but I, I know. I mean, Chicago. Think about, it. think about the experience level and that yeah. sort of thing. Now, granted, you know, Obama's got a few people around him that maybe they have some experience, but not right. uh, the kind that 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 Reagan had around him. Sure, Reagan wasn't a foreign policy genius, although he had his principles. But he was smart enough to bring people around him, like George Shultz. No, like Cap Weinberger, that, that like was, James Baker, people who were real giants in the field, you know? And that was something that I wanted to ask you about, and it's very fortuitous that you brought it up. Um, obviously, for you young people listening, when Ronald Reagan was elected and uh, ran for president the first time and the second time, really, there was no Internet. Mm-hmm. There was no alternative media. You only had yourself right. and what any cable stations that happened to be on. I don't even know if CNN was around back when he was elected the first they, time. They, they may started have been. sort of a little bit, just yeah. kind of partway into the administration. Yeah, yeah, we had, I think we had cable back then, my first wife and I. I can't really remember. But I know what what I got from Ronald Reagan, because he he went around the media and he talked directly to us people. And what I got mm-hmm. from him, the, 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 the flavor of what he was doing is that he was able to uh, was very comfortable delegating authority. He would hire the right people, like oh, you yeah. said, Schultz and Haig and everybody else. And he said, "I want to do this, this, and this. Let me know when it's done. Go." Exactly. And there's something else that I've thought about a lot as I look at some of the things that go on in this in this White House and this administration. And mm-hmm. that is, there was a phrase that was repeated, I can't tell you how many times, drummed into us during the Reagan days. And it was, personnel is policy, which means be darn careful whom you appoint to what positions because they bring their philosophies and their experience with them, and they will create the policy, uh, of course, you know, the president's policy, but backing it up with their own experience and their own philosophy. And uh, we all have to remember that a president has at least, I think it's more more now, but uh, in those days, 3,000 uh, presidential appointments that he, that he can make. Not just cabinet, but assistant secretaries and all the bureaus and all that sort of thing. Uh, many of them, of course, uh, get Senate confirmation. But just, just think about that. 3,000, all the top people, decision makers. So personnel is policy. And I look around this administration, and it doesn't give me a whole lot of sense of confidence that they know what they're doing. Well, and, and don't forget that a lot of these people are, um, there were the radicals from the 1960s that he surrounded himself with, the people that he learned from. They were, they were all radicals. They, they were the underground weathermen. They were the uh, people that thought he should be socialist or communist. Those are the people that he surrounded himself with. And I've got to say, Karna, I think it's very a very dangerous thing to do. Well, it, it one thing that... Um I don't mean to make light of this, but uh, I thought about something sort of early on when he started appointing people. I did a little bit of research, and uh, you know the Russian. Come back to the Russians. The Russians had 22 czars. They used to have these czars, of course, uh, used to that, and they served over a period of 400 years. Uh, 
but they served one at a time, okay? Mm -hmm. Obama appointed something like 28 czars in nine months, you know, white house czars. And and they weren't, um, uh, we've always had a couple of white house czars made for drug policy or just something to pull some regulations together. But what he did was he was bypassing the Senate confirmation process by putting someone in between him and those confirmed by the Senate hmm. because they were White House staff, and White House staff is not confirmed. There are only a couple people are, OMB and so forth, but most everybody is not that's a presidential appointee. And and I don't know what those people do. You know, they're in there writing regulations and recommending policies, and it's kind of scary, you know, to well, me. Well, we know that Van Jones, the guy that he had as his uh, green energy czar, we know that guy's a oh, communist, I, I, absolutely and totally through and through. I mean, you, you his, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think uh, if he got a cut, hammers and sickles would fall out of his uh, out of his well, veins. <laughs> I, it's, well, of course, some of them have left. Uh, you know, I don't want to uh, make right. a broad brush over everyone. Of course, there are a lot of people that want to serve uh, their country, and they get in certain jobs, and some of them, I, I am sure, are working very hard. But, but. Uh, Generally speaking, I am concerned about the appointees. By the way, I had an idea, uh, Bill, mm -hmm. and that is that as long as we are chatting here, you, perhaps you have a uh, system for doing this, but if you have any listeners uh, there who might want to ask me a question, I've got my computer in front of me. They could shoot me a quick email, and I'd be very happy to answer uh, any question. And my email from my website is just Karna, my first name, K-A-R-N-A, -A, at karnabodman.com it's my first name k-a-r-n-a -A, at karna and then my last name b is in boy o-d-m-a-n like your bod karnabodman.com you know shoot me an email and then if we do have a question from one of your listeners maybe we can uh, see if we can answer it that would be excellent and don't forget that this is recorded and on the internet so you may be getting questions for months or years <laughs> I try to answer them all. I mean, my website is carnabodman dot com, and right. I because uh, you know I'm an author, so I get a lot of uh, kind of interesting questions from people about all kinds of subjects. Right. But anyway, go ahead. We'll we'll, we'll talk fact, on your uh, subject. In fact, while right I'm uh, while we're thinking about Art. it, there we go. I have your website up right now on the um, on the video side for anybody that is there. And you see uh, there's a photograph of Karna right there and the uh, cover of her new book, Castle Bravo. It actually came out last year, I think, in December. But uh, Castle Bravo is the name of her book, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about tonight. But right now we are talking about the sad affairs of politics in the United States right now. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, Karna, we have... Um, so I mentioned to you before the show, we have uh, severe thunderstorms coming through the area. I'm looking out my studio window, and it looks like we've got about a 60-mile-an-hour wind and lightning oh flashes God. all over the place. So if we lose power, all of a sudden you'll be talking to yourself. Um, <laughs> I understand. You can always call me back. Right. And um, <laughs> so if we do get knocked off the I air, folks... I hope others are able to tune in. I, I hope they're able to, uh, you know, catch you on the Internet. Can... You know, hope that all works. Yes, uh, you know, even if the power goes out, I'm um, rec all of this is being recorded by Blog Talk and here in the studio and everything. And uh, you know, if we have to take it up at a later time, that's fine. But um, hopefully, the power will stay in. I, uh, of course, mm -hmm. um, uh, going along with the topic of your book, I have uh, I'm what you call one of those crazy preppers. We have uh, I have. Great. Um, uh, I do a lot of alternative energy stuff, which is kind of weird for me being a conservative. But I do do the alternative energy stuff. I have solar panels and deep cycle batteries and inverters. And uh, I have 12-volt power Good. supplies for all the computers here. So I can power up the whole place uh, off of a uh, deep cycle battery bank while we're here. And um, it go that goes along directly with the topic of your book. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're one of the few people that are going to survive this. <laughs> well, I don't know. About, well, we're going to survive it for a couple of weeks anyways <laughs> until everybody figures out that we got food and power. But I have... Uh, well, exactly. Uh, and of course, folks, if you are um, if you do plan for any, dis any disasters, um, one of the key things that a lot of people will tell you, and I will tell you right now, 
do not advertise to everybody that you know that you are prepared because they're not and they're going to come someplace to take your stuff away and that's going to be wherever you are so be careful and be aware at any rate why don't we talk about your book because um, I think it goes hand in hand with some of the political shenanigans that are going on right now um, specifically ignoring uh, threats and um, the uh, national government being prepared for these type of threats so why don't you tell everybody uh, what the plot of the book is sure I'd be glad to uh, castle each one of my of my no these are novels folks but they are based on uh, real uh, ideas real events uh, a lot of research uh, this book castle Bravo is actually named I, I stole the title uh, it what that was the name uh, the code name of a top secret project and then when it was declassified I thought great that fits right into the story so I I stole it that's the name of the book Castle Bravo uh, it's the story uh, each one of my books focuses on a different national security threat to our country but they're thrillers you know they're like they're, they're like mystery thrillers that you will read that uh, other people write like Vince Flynn and Brad Thor and, and and several others who are who are really terrific uh, in the thriller genre I would hope to be as, as good a writer as, as they are um, this particular book uh, is all based on the real threat of of something that was explained to me by a major general who we had an incredible conversation a while back and he was head of our entire missile defense uh, agency uh, worldwide and many of your listeners would know that we do have missile defense batteries up and down the the uh, west coast at Vandenberg Air Force Base that's near Santa Barbara tied in with radar and satellites up in uh, Fort Greeley, Alaska, and so forth. Uh, but we don't have any in the East Coast. Now, the conversation went like this. He said, Karna, let me tell you why we really need an expanded missile defense force. I said, well, okay, uh, the current administration is uh, cutting back on that sort of thing, but oh, boy. Well, here's why. He said, let me paint a scenario for you. Let's imagine it's a few years down the road, and some militant group, country didn't like us, some enemy somehow gets hold of a small nuclear device. Now, they're all trying, right? I mean, my God, Pakistan's got 100 of them. I mean, others have uh, nukes. Uh, they're, they're trying to develop them. And let's say they also get hold of a delivery vehicle, meaning a missile you could strap it onto and shoot it off. Okay, it could be as simple as a Scud missile. And uh, by the way, somebody tried to, might, we might have mentioned this before when I was on your show once, uh, a few months ago, somebody tried to sell a Scud missile on eBay, and uh, FBI caught that guy. Okay, but people have, uh, other countries have those. So let's say, the general went on, that they're off in some boat off one of our coasts. It could be a disguised fishing vessel or something. You'd never find them. There's ships all over the place. And what they're going to do is they're not going to aim it at New York or San Francisco or, or, or L.A., which would be devastating, obviously. No, what they're going to do is they're going to aim it straight up in the air. And they're going to detonate it. It could be 50 miles or more up in the air. I mean, a scud goes far in it. Um, now, what happens when you do that? It doesn't kill you on the ground. No, it, it really doesn't. What it does, though, is it creates... Think of shock waves emanating from that blast, just to put it in simple terms. Now, those shock waves have a name. It's called an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. And what that does is it fries all of the electronics on the ground. He looked at me and said, Karna, we would have no electricity grid, no Internet, no communications, no refrigeration, sanitation, transportation. He said it would set us back to the year 1910. And don't think that our enemies aren't looking at this type of technology and this type of weapon. So I thought, oh, wow, I've got to write a story about this. And so I created uh, the story of Castle Bravo, which um, is, God, I hope it's not prescient. I mean, it is absolutely devastating. Uh, there, there are other books I've written about the EMP threat. But it hasn't really captured the public's attention as 
I hope that it will eventually. It came up a little bit in the presidential debates. Newt brought it up, but uh, hasn't been talked about. We did have an EMP commission that testified before the House Armed Services Committee, but made all kinds of recommendations, how we could protect ourselves, harden the grid, do all kinds of things. But, uh, you know, everybody, oh, it takes money, uh, spending money, it's not going to happen, push it down the road. And it could be an extremely dangerous and absolutely debilitating type of attack on our country or on our allies or on our troops overseas. Yes. So I wrote a story about it. That is exactly correct. I have, um, right now I'm looking at a story. Um, I've actually been flipping back and forth between a bunch of different uh, websites and documents. I have the document that you were just talking about, the Report of the Commission to Assess the Threat of the United States to the there United States from Electromagnetic Pulse Attack, Critical National Infrastructures. And up on mm -hmm. the screen right now, for those of you watching on the video side, are the commission members that uh, mm -hmm. actually gave the report. Now, over here... Have you got a date on that thing? Oh, uh, let me see. Uh, April 2008. Exactly. To I believe that's the last time they testified. And here we are, 2013, and I don't believe much of anything has been done. Oh, I think Air Force One is hardened, but, you know, come yeah. on. Um, now, I'm uh, over here on the Real Agenda website. Uh, that's realagenda.com. They have an uh, article here from uh, July 22nd of 2011 by uh, Luis Miranda entitled China Developing Electromagnetic Weapons. Now, mm -hmm. if we look at this map that I have on here uh, right now, you can see that if a... Um, and I can't really tell which state it is um, just west of uh, oh, about one state away from Wisconsin if you look uh, maybe in the corner of Kansas okay now uh -huh. they are okay. referencing a um, nuclear device that was set off in let me see here let me get my notes up okay in uh, 1962 and um, uh -huh. th this is uh, amazing folks because Karna uses this event in her book without realizing that she's actually using an historical event, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. In, 19, <laughs> <I know. laughs> in 1962, the Soviets um, launched a W-49 warhead. Uh, actually, no, that our Starfish Prime test was a W-49. I'm sorry. They um, launched an EMP weapon over Kazakhstan. And it was a 300 kiloton thermonuclear warhead. They uh, exploded it at a 180 mile altitude, which a Scud can do quite easily. Now, if you were to do that over the United States, I have on this map, it would, um, let me see, 50% electronics and electrical failure would extend all the way up past, uh, it would extend past Hudson Bay well past um, Mexico City, almost down to Panama, it would, 50% uh, now, would be New York, Miami, Houston, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, San Francisco, Seattle, Churchill, Canada, Edmonton. Oh, yeah. This um, is why you've got a heck of an argument for even having missile defense systems looking inward, not outward, in case somehow someone right. was able to uh, get something to the interior of our country. Here, where I, where I live in Michigan... 80% failure over the rest of the country, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and the real question, Bill, I, I mean, I, you're right, and in, in my story I do reference some of the atmospheric testing that our country did, as well as the Russians did, way back in the 50s and 60s uh, after World War II, just to prove that we had these kinds of weapons, and then, then later we didn't do any more atmospheric testing. We did underground testing and so forth. We haven't done atmospheric testing for a long time, but the right. point is, back then we learned about this effect this EMP effect I mean scientists have known about it because it, even our tests out on the Marshall Islands and we talk Bikini Atoll and so forth uh, way out there uh, bomb goes off uh, up higher and all the uh, the communications uh, over in Hawaii thousand miles away dim and get all screwed up and we didn't have a lot of computers in those days right so just imagine what would happen today when we are so totally dependent 
on electronics and the Internet and everything else, everything from medical records to our cars. None of our cars would work. Except, well, I'll tell you what would work. The old, remember the old 50 Chevys? I think Cuba's got a few of them. <laughs> we yes. never should have had that, that uh, cash for clunkers deal, I'll tell you. But in it, not to make light of it, but um, no, this this would be absolutely devastating. And yes, countries, you're right. The Russians know about it, the Chinese. And we have uh, developed types of what we call e-weapons, meaning electronic, it, not using nuclear materials, but creating a similar effect, you know, yes. microwaves and so forth. And in fact, we just, um, one of our defense contractors developed one, a very clever one, uh, put it that way, that they tested a few months ago, uh, and what they did was they had this, this weapon, and they had this old warehouse, and they f- filled it up with a bunch of computers and so forth they didn't need, and TV cameras to record everything, and then they strapped this, uh, this new weapon they called CHAMP on sort of like a missile, think of a drone, you know, kind of a thing that would fly over, not with a person, but just a you know, cruise, guided over missile. the building. And then they set it off, and when they went in, every computer was fried, and all the TV cameras were down, and they don't come back as you would after a blackout. They're fried. you got to throw them away and start over again. Yes. So, yeah, we've got those kind of weapons, and you can be darn sure that other countries are developing them as well. What would we do? Let me ask you that. How would you live? The Amish might make it, but I don't know about thee and me. Yeah. Um, people that uh, are prepared. Um, I, I mean, it's... You know, prepared for how long? We all get prepared for you know, hurricanes or right. you know, blackouts and things that might last a week or two. Uh, well, but, it, uh, but what about after that? Well, the, the preparation aspect of it is um, it can actually be pretty simple because when... Our country, the United States, and uh, as a matter of fact, by the way, I have an actual photograph of uh, the atomic test that uh, knocked out Hawaii. It is a photograph taken from Hawaii of the test. Mm -hmm. You can uh, see it Mm -hmm. up on the screen now on the video side. Um, When they were uh, initially testing the um, uh, atomic bombs, here in the United States for use in World War II, they discovered that all of their uh, electronics and whatnot got uh, knocked out. And one of the mm-hmm. bright boys, I can't, it might have been Oppenheimer that figured this out, actually, I think. I don't have the story right here in front of me. I'm sure it's in one of my documents here. But he discovered that um, if they put a protective screening around uh, their electronics equipment, it would stop the... Um, the E1, E2, and most of the E3 um, expulsions mm-hmm. of the um, of the uh, uh, waves of the um, EMP, and mm-hmm. you can do that at home. I have um, a lot of people have um, a shortwave radio, uh, an extra laptop computer, um, batteries, um, any types of small electronics that you have. All you really need, Karna, is. Um, like a copy paper box and line the outside with aluminum foil so it's completely mm-hmm. enclosed and um, put all your stuff in there and that will protect it from the EMP pulse. I have uh, metal file cabinets here in my studio that I have uh, shortwave radio and um, uh, other electronics in uh, and I have it in the um, uh, metal filing cabinets but the important thing is that you have to insulate the product itself from the metal conductor. So if you use a metal box, you have to put a cardboard box inside of that metal box. And sure. You, but the problem, Bill, is your computer might be protected all by itself. Right. If you can't connect to anybody, so what? Well, I've got, you know, uh, terabytes of uh, information on uh, all my computers here, so I, I do what I can. Yeah, I just I meant I can't if, if, if we can't communicate right. with each other and there's no television and there's no news and you don't know what's happening and the military can't control things and they can't communicate with uh, with their troops and ships and all the rest of it. I just mean, and, and, and if cars are not working and if trains and trucks aren't working, we're not going to get food into the cities. We're not going to get water. We're not going to have sanitation because all of those big factories and... Uh, places, uh, you know, are run with electronic systems. Right. And so, yeah, each of us can do what we can, and we should, but we need to do so much more in this country, particularly with the whole electricity grid, because if it, were, if it goes down and it's fried, as we say, 
all those turbines, we don't have extra ones over in a closet somewhere. No. They have to be replaced, and it takes a year or two, and we don't even make them anymore. I think they make them over in Japan somewhere. Yeah, and... Uh, are you going to get them here? Most of our transformers are made in China now. They have to come over on a yeah, uh, ship. Yeah, China, Japan, whatever. So th- that's what I mean. So I just mean it would be an unbelievable situation. There was a there was a TV show on uh, NBC that wasn't a great show. It was over the top, but it was called Revolution. Mm-hmm. Uh, last year, I saw that, and you know, a lot of people saw it, and and it was just that the concept was right in my book. It's it's how do we live? Theirs was 15 years after after all electronics are gone, and they didn't, yeah. didn't really explain in the show how they were knocked out, but it doesn't matter. The point is, oh, robbers and bad guys were marauding the countryside on horseback, you know, and you weren't allowed to have a gun because they took them all, and that's one thing we need, and that is weapons to protect ourselves. Yes. You know, this is a gun rights issue, too. But, well, we're getting far afield here, but in the story of Castle Bravo, if anybody would like to read a thriller, um, it's all very contemporary, and I have a White House heroine, a gal who's head of the White House Office of Homeland Security, who gets word that some of this research is going on in some of these countries, gets intel about it, gets very concerned, and tries to raise awareness. And, of course, all the bureaucrats, you know, they're busy with something else and all this and that. And uh, the love of her life is a business guy, and he's sent overseas to Kazakhstan, as you mentioned it before, and gets in a situation, he's on a business trip, but he gets in a situation where he's out in a remote area uh, where one of these uh, EMP things does occur by mistake. Well, does he get out? What happens? And then uh, maybe people realize the effect of it, and maybe they're going to be targeting this country, and what are we going to do to stop them? And it's a thriller. It really is. And it's very personal, and she's trying to figure out where he is and what's going on, and and how's, how are they going to stop the bad guys, and what are we going to do? And um, this is the definition of a thriller. You know, stop it before Dr. No blows up Silicon Valley. <laughs> you know, yeah, the old exactly. Kind of movies. But that's the story of Castle Bravo, and I might remind your listeners, to, uh, if you want to send me an email, karna at um with a question, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get you, and we'll, we'll put it on. Anyway, so that's the story. Oh, and I might also mention, um, if someone likes to check out a book, uh, you know, sometimes it's fun to read a chapter or two and say, sort of test it, see if you like it or not, and uh, some authors do that. And just go to my website, com, and and the book, uh, there's a link right there in the front, and it says here you can read the first five chapters free. Just click on the link and you can read it. The first five chapters, if you like it, you like the characters, fine. Maybe you'll want to read the whole book. If not, save your money. You know what, you're really so good, because uh, up on the video screen, I actually have the first chapter. <laughs> On the screen yeah, right now, go. so the viewers can... See, it's right uh, there. Yeah. So anybody can read it if they want to. Uh, you know, it, it's right there, and, and they can check it out. And sometimes it's kind of fun. If you're looking for a new book to read, a novel, uh, or maybe give it a gift to a friend or something, and say, oh, hey, here's a new author I didn't know about. And she's got White House experience, and she's woven all those experiences into these books. And we got scenes in the Situation Room and scenes in the Oval Office and scenes around D.C. and the restaurants, and there's a love interest going on here. So, hey, it might be kind of a fun read. So now, check now, out Castle Bravo. I have to tell the audience that, um, and, and incidentally, this will be on uh, our YouTube channel, Sun Sky Mysteries. So uh, this entire show, the video side of the show, will be up uh, up there. So um, mm-hmm. people in perpetuity will be uh, seeing this for as uh, <laughs> as long as the internet is around well, until the book will be available at least as an ebook. You know, I'm yeah, sure in uh, perpetuity. Um, although the hardback is sold out, but you can still get the trade paperback or the audio version or the ebook. Well, uh, yeah, un- until those crazy Iranians decide to knock out electricity, and then all you're going to have is the paper book. It is the paperback, uh, unless sure. you protected your electronics, as we suggested a little bit earlier. Um, right. What was I going to say? Yes, it's uh, this will be up on um, on the YouTube channel, and uh, the audio version of the show will be up on uh, ussamichigan.com, along with the show notes and everything, so people can follow along. And um, I have to tell you guys that um, I got the book. When did I get it? I think I got it on payday. I think I got it on f- last Friday. And I started started reading it. I mean, okay, I got to read, uh, you know, because you got to read the author's books, and I try to read cover to cover the author's books because mm-hmm. I owe it to them. So I'm well versed on uh, what they do, and usually it's uh, 
bleedingly boring because not every book is good however some books are and I started reading this and um, the young lady in here Samantha Reed the uh, lead character the heroine yeah. yep the heroine she is um, uh, intensely worried about something loses sleep over something and as it turns out it's the same thing that I lose sleep over a massive EMP ta attack on the mm -hmm. country so I started reading it and when I when I read a book, if I like the book, I read it from cover to cover without stopping. I might take a break for a couple hours, but when I read it, it's um, when I'm on Netflix and I'm watching a show like Fringe. I watched uh, I watched one season at a time, 26 episodes straight. I was oh up at four in the morning until <laughs> uh, maybe midnight, and the only thing I did was stop to uh, to eat dinner and, and whatnot. I, and that's mm -hmm. the, just the way I do things. I read this book, folks, in six hours. It is um, on the one hand, it's an easy read. On the other hand, it is very exciting. You don't want to put it down. This is a good book. See, now I got to go and buy all of your other books too, so that oh, I can read you're those. Oh, very sweet. And I, I'll tell you, Karna, it is um, it is. It's got a lot of romantic stuff in it, but it's uh, yeah. the way people really are, the way they think. And it and you don't, um, and Karna doesn't uh, get caught up in the minutia. You know, she doesn't, uh, no. not like Stephen King where he was wearing a plaid shirt and the uh, second button down was a little bit askew because the sewing machine wasn't mm -hmm. set up correctly in China. You know, she, uh, he, yeah. was, he was wearing a plaid shirt and he sat down. He looked around and said, you know, we're screwed. Right. <laughs> you know, and it's it, that it's not. I I don't write in in a literary flowery manner. I try to get to the point, as they say, um, yeah. because I write very short chapters as well. You know, each scene is a new chapter, and we just keep it going. I I want to keep the momentum going if right. I possibly can. So I write from a, a couple different points of view. And one thing that I did learn, uh, Bill, this is years ago when I I was reading other people's terrific books, and I happened to be reading a book by a wonderful former CIA operative by the name of Charles McCary, mm -hmm. been writing books for years. The man's now in his 80s, I believe. But I read one of his earlier books called Shelley's Heart, and I looked at it. I, it was all about Washington and intrigue and all that sort of thing, so I was all caught up in it. But I, there was something I noticed about what he did with the format of that book. What he did was, and I don't see very many authors doing this, but I copied him, and that is he lists the major characters in the front of the book. Yeah. And so I do that. I say Samantha Reed, she's director of the White House office, you know, uh, her love of her life, Trip Adams, he's the guy, the NSC advisor is so-and-so, and so. And you just list the major characters. Just There are a few, because most people are not like you. Most people read a book, they read a couple chapters, put it down, come back a few days later, you know, read a few more, and they say, wait a minute, who, who was that guy, uh, trip again who was, and then you can go right back in the beginning leaf back oh that's right that's who that was and and i wish more authors would do that because sometimes you know you read a book there's a bunch of characters who was ken you know can't remember <laughs> right so i always uh, I, I list them in every one of my books you've got characters right in the front uh that readers can refer to and i've had a lot of people send me notes say hey thanks for doing that it really helps larry niven does that too he uh, in his books. Yeah, he put, I mean a few people do. And I think Heinlein did too. I think Heinlein did uh, in his uh, sci-fi books as well. If I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. he yeah. also. There are a few. Yeah. But anyway, so I do. And in fact, the book just before Castle Bravo, it's called Final Finesse. Uh, that one has the same characters. It kind of sets it up actually, and then Castle Bravo is a bit of a follow-on. Although you can read them separately if you'd like to. So you might like that one too. That's also about Samantha Reed. Yeah, I've got uh, your and page the White up House and so forth. right now about uh, Final Finesse, written by a top White House staffer. Final Finesse is a first-rate thriller packed with marvelous... Yeah, I think that one, the, the hardbacks are pretty well sold out. You have to buy uh -huh. them from resellers or something. But the uh, I think there's some paperbacks still available. I hope I hope there are. Yeah. People are still buying it, and of course, e-books are always available. Yeah, that's what I do. I have uh, I have Kindle on all my laptops and computers, so I just uh, download well, everything yeah, you, the Kindle. You can always get an e-book, and you can get the first two, Gambit and Checkmate, uh, you know, for if if you're interested. Those are the other books too. But I'll tell you something else, Bill. Mm -hmm. Certain aspects of my first three books, not Castle Bravo yet, but the first three books, uh, things that I wrote about later came true. Kind of freaks me out, you know. Yeah, thanks. I mean, Appreciate amazing. that. 
So <laughs> okay, you, you can stop know, writing any time now. You don't really want to be prescient with this. Yeah, just like you can just stop text. writing. Um, maybe you could write textbooks or something. No, I'm not going to. No, in fact, I've already finished uh, the fifth thriller. Uh, mm -hmm. It won't be out for a while. But uh, later on, maybe when that one comes out, maybe I can come back and chat with you again. And okay. that one uh, involves Russians or in, in that book. Um, but the title might amuse you because it actually fits in with some dialogue in a particular scene. And the title is Trust But Verify. Oh, excellent. I like that term. And I've had that one now for months. I mean, I've been working on that. And, of course, now you see that Obama's trying to use that term. Yes. He, he borrowed it yesterday. He said, oh, that's what we're going to do with the Syrians, you know, and trust but verify. Yeah, right. I'm sure I have Good a luck. Reagan clip about that, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what I wanted to ask you while we've been talking about the book, um, and uh, obviously a lot of it takes place in the White House and in the political intrigue and everything, um, how... Close. I, obviously, you're using your uh, your own experiences uh, in the White House. Um, mm -hmm. Tell the audience a little bit about your experiences in the White House with Ronald Reagan and everything, and, and exactly what you did, and how how much of that do you actually put in the books? How much of that is like the real day to day nitty gritty type of conversations? <laughs> well, okay. Um, I did have a couple different jobs. I was here for six years, so. Yeah, you work up into different roles. My first job was deputy press secretary, deputy Jim Brady. Mm -hmm. And we all remember Jim very fondly, of course. And as yes. a matter of fact, uh, we might have talked about this on a previous appearance on your show. Um, I was scheduled to be in the car with Jim on March 30th. Oh, boy. And I was standing in front of his desk in the West Wing press office uh, just before the motorcade was going to leave. And I just said, oh, I've got so much work to do. Oh, my gosh, you know, i got press calls to return, and i got guidance to work up for your next briefing, and oh, and I, I don't know. And Jim looked at me and said, hey, listen, no problem. You don't have to go on this one. I'm going anyway. It's, it's no big deal. It's a little speech at the Hilton Hotel for a union group. I mean, uh, no, uh, don't worry about it. You go tomorrow. You stay here. You take the, do the phone calls and all that sort of thing. I'll be back around 2.30. See you then. And off they went. And everybody knows that. When they walked out of that Hilton Hotel, I would have been standing right next to Jim, probably. Oh, man. When John Hinckley fired six shots in three seconds combat style using a devastation bullet he thought would explode inside the victim. That's what he called it, and right. it didn't uh, for only one reason. It was using a smaller gun, a twenty two. But I would have been standing right there. I actually spent the day in the Situation Room, and you ask about uh, you know experiences. Now, I don't obviously use that event particularly in my books, but the mood, you know, the mood of a right. crisis situation, the meetings in the sit room, I was there every single morning. Um, after that job later, we moved around. My last job was senior director and spokesman for the National Security Council. So then I was focusing on foreign policy issues and national security and that sort of thing, which is why today when I'm writing these novels, um, I do talk about different national security threats. And they're contemporary, though. They don't go back to Reagan's day. They're contemporary. But they were influenced, obviously, by my experience there. And the first book I wrote, Checkmate, and again, uh, some ideas for Castle Bravo, came from Reagan's announcement of his strategic defense initiative, Star Wars, Missile Defense, yeah. which at the time was this revolutionary thought that everybody in town, all the press thought, was crazy. And they, were, they were saying, Wait, what does Reagan think he's you know, Superman, a bullet hitting a bullet. Uh, you know, he's nuts. It's never going to work. Well, of course, it does work. I wish he were alive today to see that we've had over 30 successful tests against ballistic missile targets. And we've got those interceptors, as I mentioned earlier, along the West Coast. We've got the Aegis system on ships. There's an airborne laser that's really cool, but of course, unfortunately, the Obama administration has cut back on some of the funding. But, mm. you know, funding for missile defense, I Lord, it's minuscule. It's it's something. The entire budget worldwide is something like nine billion dollars in a half a trillion dollar Pentagon budget. So I just hope they don't cut any more of that. Yeah. But uh, in any event, so yeah, those experiences are all um, uh, and settings and moods and some of the characters. I sure do draw on them when I write the stories. And and I get emails from people. They say, you know, we felt kind of like insiders, which is fun because I want. You want to learn something when you read a book, spend the time, and, but you want to have a good time. And in fact, 
One of my favorite quotes is from George Bernard Shaw, who said, the best way to get your point across is to entertain. So I'm trying to get the point across that we got to be doing this, this, or this in terms of protecting ourselves, you know, from a uh, national security standpoint. But I want people to have a good time. Read a good, read a good story. Have fun with a thriller, and that's what I've been doing. Yes, you're our, to do. actually our second guest. Um, second, yeah, second guest that uh, is uh, is um, uh, telling that through um, an entertainment venue, and it's. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's uh, quite a, a viable way to do it. Cause it's well, sure. I mean, authors do enjoy, obviously, the opportunity to get on talk shows, and we I do a lot of radio interviews and some TV and so forth, because you need to spread the word. Uh, there's so many books out there. There are millions, obviously. Three yeah. million books are, are, are out about every year uh, in one form or another, and it's very, very hard because people just notice the ones, maybe ten titles, on a bestseller list. Well, my goodness, there's so many good books out there, and how are you going to know about them? You know, how, how, how are you going to know? And it's particularly difficult now for any author, if anyone is listening and they're an aspiring writer, or maybe they know someone who is, um, they know that marketing is the key. And uh, as I say, spread the word. And it's, um, it's even more challenging now because in the old days, if you couldn't get an agent or a publisher and most people couldn't because I think the numbers were the 2%, 1% rule. 2% of aspiring writers got agents and 1% got published. I mean, it's mm-hmm. really, really tough out there. Probably the same today. And in the old days, you could publish yourself. They would called it a vanity press. You pay some printing company and you, you know, print up 100 copies and sell it to your, you know, put it in your garage and sell it to your Christmas card list or something. But now it's very easy. People can just uh, have it, the book formatted from a document and just put it up on Amazon for 99 cents or 2.99 or whatever they want to do. But then the question is, you know, they're not edited particularly. Some are probably terrific and some maybe not so terrific, who knows. But how do all those authors get noticed? It's really really hard. Um let me just ask you, um do you have any idea how many people put up a memoir, or a children's book or a novel, whatever? You know, didn't get an agent, so they just published themselves last year. Yes, you know, I uh, published on on Amazon. What do, What do you think? Give me a number. I actually do have a good idea because I had one of them on this show. Um, there oh, okay. are there are literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people. I mean, anybody can do it. Amazon's got instructions for doing it, and anybody can sell anything. And the author that I had on, he had a severely mentally damaged son. And he kept a daily journal, and he turned it into a novel. It was called What About the Boy? And he joined um, a- another thing that uh, aspiring authors can do. He just joined a uh, writer's club. And he wrote the book and put it on Amazon. And he was on uh, radio, um, radioguestlist.com. And I found him the same way that I found you. You know, just like, boop, uh, mm-hmm. okay, this person wants to be interviewed, great. And he has actually w- won... A series of awards for this book. It was a most remarkable book. It was so touching. There was yeah, there but that's were, terrific. There was times during it, that it, book it, when it, I I just started crying it, because of that because of the, what that poor family went through. Exactly, but here but here's the problem. Uh, I mean, the challenge, mm-hmm. the problem, challenge uh, for anybody, whether he for his book or my book or anybody's book really that's out there, whether it's published by a major publisher or, or by yourself. Um, the number that I got for Publishers Weekly for last year, and this year it's probably even more, was 238,000. Those are the people that just self-published on I b- Amazon. I believe year. it, yeah. Now, how, how, do you, how do you know what's good? I mean, you, most people, when, when they go into Barnes & Noble, for example, you look at the, you walk in the front door, and there's the new release table, right, for, for fiction and for non you kind of maybe you browse around you say oh that's kind of a cool cover oh look at the blurb that guy oh, that looks pretty good i don't know that author but hey, maybe i'll try that one you kind of look at it you pick it up you read the back flap and so forth and and new writers have a chance to be noticed because there they are right on the table and by the front door but now stores are cutting back on all that publishers don't have the budgets to purchase that space because every space 
on that new release table is paid for real estate. Publishers have to pay the store to put it there. And so they just put maybe their best-selling authors that they know they can make a few bucks on. So it's very, very competitive. But when you go to Amazon, generally speaking, most people, they hear that there's a new book. Oh, Nelson Mill has a new book. I'll just go to Amazon, click, put the name in, that's it, buy the book. You don't generally go to Amazon to browse around. Oh, gee, where will I find a new thriller about the White House today? You know, it's yeah. just a very, very tough game. So that's why I'm glad to be on your show. And I Thank hope you. people want to read Castle Bravo or go to the website, com, and, and check it out. And, uh, you know, I speak to groups around the, uh, the country. That's what we all have to do. And there's social media, of course. But, uh, you know, it... it I, my only point is it's a challenge, and there are a lot of great writers that probably have not yet been discovered. Yes, I, uh, I'm one of those browsers on Amazon sometimes, and I want to get a new book. I just go on to Amazon, and I just like click science fiction and start looking at all the different science fiction books. And they're like, like 99 cents mm-hmm. for the ebook. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And as far as coming on the show goes, I am always amazed and thrilled uh, the people, the caliber of people like yourself that want to come on my little podunk show um, that I'm doing on the internet. Um, you know, some shows can you can have ten thousand listeners. Some shows you can have one or two listeners, and but it, it's all compound. Sure. It all compounds and builds up over days and weeks and years because it's out there for in perpetuity. I mean, our our YouTube mm-hmm. channel has. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, we're close to a quarter million total views on. Uh, on all the shows that I've done since 2011, and it it's mm-hmm. absolutely thrilling for me. Uh, some guy, you know, just doing his show. Yeah, I'm surrounded by four computers. I got a soundboard and everything else. But it's thrilling for me when I look at your website and I see senior director and spokesman for the National Security Council. That is, um, it, it just it just amazes me. And having you on September 11th, it just means literally so much to to me to be able to talk to somebody with your experience. Well, thank you. I, look, there are tons, hundreds of people who have served in the White House or in various government positions, and I'm sure they, they all have experiences to, to share. Um, I, I will say this, though. We did a little bit of research, and I haven't found another woman, except one, uh, who, who, was, who served... Um, as a senior White House official in any administration who's writing novels today. There is one who served in, in, in the Bush White House mm-hmm. um, in the communications area. But I don't know anybody else. And somebody said, well, gee, um, what about Margaret Truman? I said, well, she wasn't on the staff. <laughs> so yeah. it's a small club here uh, that we are writing books. I mean, there are other people. Uh, Cap Weinberger uh, had a thriller out, but actually he wrote it with another author, Peter Schweitzer. Right. I think Barbara Boxer wrote a thriller, but she's on the Hill. But I haven't found any, but any other women. I Maybe I'm missing something here, but uh, haven't found them yet. Most people write memoirs when they work in the White right. House. Uh, you're doing uh, a very good job. Do that. You're doing a very good job at, your, at writing your novels. I am... Uh suitably impressed and i i i uh my reading experience goes asimov heinlein niven um uh, steve Kuntz, uh you know mm-hmm. stephen king all of those so i have a uh, right. i have a rather well-developed taste over my 55 years of reading books and uh, your, your books it's an easy read and it's a good plot and it's got good character development and that's what you look when a, that's what a reader looks for <clears throat> well, um, I appreciate that. You know, just mention on Facebook or something, or maybe <laughs> something that, you know, how do you spread the word otherwise? I'll tell you no, what, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and upload, up, do I'm going to upload just the video the that I'm, I'm going to upload the video that I'm creating tonight onto my Facebook page so that everybody can see it there and hear it. Um, okay, that'd be fun. To get back to the um, um, political side of stuff. While of course. while we're while we're still here, we're um, what are we? We're well, actually, we're over an hour now um, into the show. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you, um, as far as national uh, national security threats goes, um, with mm-hmm. using your experience as somebody who watched national security threats, I would assume that when you see a news item or an event. Your brain probably still, after all these years, still clicks into that mode. You know what? What kind of a threat? What type of a threat assessment oh, is sure. this? Oh, 
<coughs> are, what are what are like the top two or three, maybe five threats against the country? I have my own set of threats, and I want to see if yours matches up to what my myself and my friends think about. Well, sure. Um, I mean, there are several uh, that actually we didn't think about you know, 20 or 30 years ago, obviously, there's so much that's new, and and different groups that would wish us harm, which uh, maybe we weren't thinking about 30 years ago, it was the Soviet Union, of course, now they are, there's still a, ch- a challenge, but now you have the whole militant Islamic threat and all of that, but you also have, I, I would put cybersecurity, um, you know, the cyber threats that everyone is, is worried about uh, infiltrating our systems uh, right up there. Um, an EMP threat would wouldn't be quite as uh, as as cur- I mean it is current and I'd put that maybe as number two uh, but I think the cyber threat uh, is is right there it's been in the headlines we have so many people working on it uh, all the time and we have uh, countries and and people just invading our systems right and left all over the place yes and it's very very scary so. I, I, I've got that up there as number one, and I've talked to a lot of people in government who, who believe the same thing. Uh, then also you have, in addition to the EMP threat that we've already discussed, um, there are other biological and chemical threats. Of course there are. And I think that if, um, if, if anybody really thought about it, the people that were responsible for 9-11, sure, they were flying airplanes, but if they had access to chemical or biological weapons, I don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind they would have used them. I mean, no doubt at all. So that is something else, you know, the water supply, the food supply, and so forth. Of course, those, I think, are threats as well. Um, and it, it, something else that is is much more diffuse and maybe hard to explain, but that is the threat of not maintaining a leadership position in the world. Yes. It encompasses an awful lot, but I really think about that uh, whenever, when I read so many articles and see what's going on uh, today, because I don't believe that this president and this administration um, see, sees that as, as a really important point, to maintain our leadership, because... Um, who else in the world can be that beacon of freedom? Um, where does where do people want to come when they have a, a problem in their own country? They want to come here. And we must maintain it because if we are not out there to protect the sea lanes from pirates, to protect free trade, to protect our allies with an umbrella of um, uh, defenses and so forth. People say, why do we have to be the policemen of the world? Why, why do we need to do that? You hear that from isolationists all the time. Mm-hmm. Well, the point is the world is shrinking, and and if not the United States, then who? Um, we do need to maintain it. Ronald Reagan talked about this a lot because one of his hallmarks was to spread freedom. That was what he wanted to do. And freedom uh, around the world and he did a pretty good job in many in many instances and I remember there's a great quote from Maggie Thatcher I think she said it oh I don't know he was out of office but she said you know Ronald Reagan won the Cold War and without firing a shot well a lot went into that as we all know uh, but these these are important points and I really think that maintaining our leadership position is absolutely paramount because without it, without our strength, economic and from a defense standpoint, uh, everyone else is emboldened. And there are bad guys. There is evil in the world. And it must be confronted and it must be contained. I agree with your uh, list completely. And your last one, um, not, maintaining our, not maintaining our leadership role. Apparently, you've been talking to Glenn Beck because he's been on that for the past two days oh, incessantly on his show. <laughs> it's, um, and, and I've been thinking the same thing, too. It's just like you beat your head up against a wall listening to this, to this stuff that's mm-hmm. com- coming out of Washington, D.C. now. It's just, I, it, it drives well, let me tell the you, average person Are you batty. a patient man, Bill? 
because I just figured something out, Uh-oh. knowing I was going to be on your show. We have 1,228 days left of the Obama presidency. I could have gone all day without hearing that. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that out there. But I'll tell you what. Uh, I am the eternal optimist. I think this is a wonderful country, and I think we um, uh, I, I, we stand for a lot, and we do believe in freedom and free enterprise and the capitalist system and all the rest of it, deep down inside. And I am looking ahead, because we have to look ahead, and I do want to be optimistic, and I'd like to make another point, and that is that we have an enormous opportunity coming up, not very far from now, in 2014 elections. And that is because of the Senate races and the way the numbers are are panning out. And uh, let me explain. And it'll be different in 2016 and different in 2018. And here's why. Because, as we all know, a third of the Senate is up every two years and you know rolls over and so forth. Well, it just happens that in 2014, of the 35 senators who are up for re-election, 14 are Republicans and 21 are Democrats. Now, see, the numbers are falling our, our way here um, to try to pick some off. Okay, of the 14 Republicans, 13 are from red states, and the last one is Maine, Susan Collins. If she gets through her primary, and I think she will, I think she's okay to be reelected. So, number one, protect your own. Now, looking at the Democratic list, there are 21 Democrats up, and of those, I believe, six are from red states. And so you've got a possibility there of possibly knocking some of those off if we can get the right candidates, you know, reasonable candidates. As we say, the most conservative candidate who can win, okay? Right. And we also have at least four, last time I looked, I've got to check that number, um, senators who would have for sure been reelected but are now retiring. Okay, you've got Jay Rockefeller in West Virginia, and we've got a terrific opportunity to pick up that seat with uh, Shelly Capito. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right. She's a seven-term congresswoman. I've met her at dinner with her. She's terrific. Mm -hmm. Her father was even governor of the state some years ago, so there's some name recognition there. That's a good one. Uh, you got Harkin in, in uh, Iowa. you got several others. And in off-year elections, the party out of power uh, sometimes does pick up five or six seats. We need six. So we need to raise the money, we need to get the vote out, and we need to have reasonable candidates who can be elected. And I think we can do it. And if we can get six, we control the Senate, we protect the Supreme Court, and we blunt any more nonsense coming out of the White House. I, um, That's my hope. Uh, I think it is kind of, I think it is more than a hope. I'll tell you what um, uh, your little uh, podunk host uh, is seeing right now. Mm -hmm. I am seeing and experiencing that people, a great number of people across the center of the country, here in the flyover area, we are so fed up and we are so upset about what is going on. I suspect exactly. that any conservative, somebody that comes out for conservative values, just like Ronald Reagan, anybody that is articulate like that and is going to go, wants to go to Washington, we will send them. Look what happened yesterday in Colorado. Uh, exactly. The, uh, for people right. that don't know, they um, passed a draconian drug law or gun law, and mm -hmm. their two leaders in their Senate have been recalled and kicked out. And mm -hmm. that is a phenomenal know, thing. That is a phenomenal it's thing. It's amazing. Yes. And look what happened in uh, Wisconsin last year, too, with... Uh, yep. Oh, I know. With their, with their Walker, votes. Right, I mean, I know. you know, and, and the thing is, these liberals, they, they stomp and they shout and they start calling names and they try to disrupt rather than actually having an argument. And I think we ha we're going to have an mm -hmm. awful lot of that to look forward to in 2014. And I just hope to God everybody's ready for it. Everybody has to be well, strong. Well, we need to get, as I said, we need to get the vote out. But we do have to have some reasonable candidates. Now, there might be some far-right candidates that we might say, gee, you know, they really sound logical. But I'm very serious when I say that we have to look at who can get elected. Because even as Chris Christie said not too long ago, he said, look, the key is to win. If we don't win, we're not being able to govern. And then what's the point? You're just crying in the wind. We need to win. And then we put our, our groups together and we appoint the right people and we, we move ahead with an agenda. So that's what we have to look at. 
well, candidates that believe in our country, but also who can win. And then we work hard as we can to get them elected. Now, now don't um, we got to make sure we don't elect people like uh, like uh, Boehner, who's just going to uh, roll over for the president every time a tough decision comes up. We got to make sure that we don't put people like that in there. Well, I'm not so sure. Uh, you got to think again about the challenges that that man has mm-hmm. um, trying to keep the uh, you know you know unruly house in line and 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 he he's the only one you know going up against uh, Harry Reid in the Senate and the whole White House. Uh, it, it it's a pretty tough job is is all I'm saying. I mean it is, and uh, I, I don't think he's he's rolled over that much. You know, they they've done all kinds of things trying to. Uh, blunt Obamacare and, and the rest of it. Um, but, but the main thing, we, we, let, let's, just, let's just keep our focus on the main issues and not get sidetracked with smaller issues. We have to keep our focus on the economy and foreign policy and defense and, you know, reducing taxes, reducing the size of government, you know, those major federal issues. And let's not get sidetracked by other things that might divide us. That, that, that's my point. You have uh, convinced me on that point. I am going to hit that on my <laughs> show every time I do my show. Um, are, you, are you up for a few more questions? Um, sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, I have a Ronald Reagan clip, and hopefully it's loud enough for everybody to hear it. But I think this will be an excellent introduction to something that I really, really want to hear your opinion on. Here we go. This idea go that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. You and I are told increasingly we have to choose between a left or right. Well, I'd like to suggest there is no such thing as a left or right. There's only an up or down. Man's own old age dream, the ultimate in individual freedom consistent with law and order, or down to the ant heap of totalitarianism. And regardless of their sincerity, their humanitarian motives, those who would trade our freedom for security have embarked on this downward course. Okay. The NSA Mm -hmm. issue. The NSA issue. Okay. What are your um, thoughts on that? I see on... um, I was uh, reading an article today, this morning as a matter of fact, um, that in 2009 the NSA was ordered to stop spying on Americans. No matter what the president says, there was a domestic spying program and they were doing a lot of it. And the judge was incensed Mm -hmm. that they didn't stop. Um, He ordered Mm -hmm. them to uh, look at the whole thing, to revamp it, and make sure you don't do it again. And apparently they didn't stop. What is your opinion on what they're doing with the NSA? Well, okay, first of all, um, this is not a simple issue, Bill. Uh, this is complicated. We, can, we, we look back, as you started your show, uh, talking about 9-11, okay? It was after 9-11 with the Patriot Act and so forth that, uh, that a lot of the surveillance was uh, geared up, as we know. Because what we were trying to do, uh, what the Bush administration was trying to do at the time, uh, obviously, was to track down those responsible and anyone that had contacts with al-Qaeda and so forth. And so they were trying to trace any calls, contacts, cell phones, phone lines, whatever, with anyone to those overseas, with those kind of people. And, And... Everyone agree to that. I mean, we're on board with that sort of thing. Of course we are, because national security comes first. Um, and, in fact, I, um, I was glad about that. And, and the act passed overwhelmingly with Congress. I mean, we didn't have a problem with that. They can bitch about it now, but they, they voted for it. Okay, um, later, I think problems uh, possibly have developed, yes, over time, uh, because our abilities and our, our electronic, um, you know, capacity and so forth, our technology is now so much more advanced than it was 10 years ago, as, as we know. So they can do a lot more. Um, and I think we have to be very, very careful about about the whole 
surveillance of Americans idea. But uh, here again, though, I don't want to paint it all with a bad brush because because when you think about it, you know, there are cameras up and down the streets and so forth, and those cameras are the ones that caught those Boston bombers, you know, the guys that uh, on the marathon day. Uh, there were cameras, sure, surveillance, and that was that. That led to getting the bad guys, getting the perpetrators. So, so yeah, there's surveillance, and yeah, we put up with it simply because there are national security threats. So, I think we have to be careful. I think we have to be very careful with the FISA courts. Uh, make sure we get the right uh, judgments to to look at, you know, these records. And and I will say this: I cannot recall. Um, maybe there were cases, but I cannot recall at this moment of your question uh, anyone American who stood up and said, I was harmed personally by the NSA. Uh, I, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen the damage. That doesn't mean that maybe they didn't look in on somebody's email account or listen to some phone call or something by mistake that they shouldn't have listened to. But I haven't seen I haven't seen results like that um, out, out there. So I guess what I'm saying is, I think there's been an overreach now by this crowd that, that's running things. Um, but I do think that some of it, some of the surveillance, especially the connections overseas, is necessary to protect the national security of the United States. Um, point taken. Uh, follow up. Um, okay. Looking at an article here in Wired Magazine. It was uh, from six oh, days yeah. ago. Uh, Representative Jim Sensenbrenner, Republican Wisconsin, mm-hmm. quickly ushered in the United States Patriot Act in the wake of September uh, 2001 terror attacks. The author, uh, but the author of the act, which is which greatly expanded the government's spy powers says the NSA mm-hmm. is abusing that law by collecting records of all telephone parts. Sorry, I didn't mean to get into the microphone that much. All telephone calls in the United States. My concern, and I think it's a concern of a lot of other people, is that, okay, maybe they're not abusing it right now. That's fine. I can, I can, I can take that. They have that big uh, new facility in uh, Nevada, and they're storing gigaquads of, uh, of information. Mm-hmm. They're, they're recording this show right now. And putting it in there. That's mm-hmm. fine. I, I can deal with that. But we've seen what can happen when we elect the wrong person, the wrong crowd in there. What happens when we get somebody in there that is more than willing to abuse that power and use that information that they've collected to actually start harming people? And I think that's where the real danger lies. Mm-hmm. I, I, I understand. I, I, I take your point, which is why we've got to be darn careful who we elect and as i say we have to have oversight proper congressional oversight of the fisa courts and all of these procedures and i think we do have people in the congress who are very concerned about it and are keeping an eye on things so yes there needs to be oversight and uh but when you talk about telephone records the the phone companies all have them anyway you know they know who called from point a to point b we get it every month on our phone bill i mean there it is there's the call to topeka kansas you know it, it, it's it's right there. So we have it, but that doesn't mean they were listening into the content of the call. That's uh, that's sort of a key here. But in any event, um, I understand the concern, and we do have to be careful who we elect, and we do need the oversight. But I think that uh, I think we do have some cooler heads prevailing and working on that right now. But although this current administration is overreaching, not just with the NSA. Oh my God, they're overreaching all over the place. By the way, I saw an article. Uh, segueing just a little bit uh, recently that was comparing executive orders of a lot of other presidents with this one. And it showed that different presidents had executive orders. Maybe there were five of them or ten of them, and somebody else had 15 of them. Obama's had hundreds yeah. of executive orders bypassing Congress. All kinds of stuff. When Reagan came in, I mean, with regulations, unbelievable. When Reagan came in, there were 87,000 pages of regulations in the Federal Register where they keep track of those. That's just the title of it, isn't the whole thing. When he left, there were 40,000 pages. He cut out over half of them, which is incredible. But now it's way back up there. The last time I looked, it was something, it was way over like 180,000. 
pages, just pages of these things, it, a lot of it from Obamacare, of course. And, and this man in the White House just overreaching with his executive orders and bypassing Congress and just deciding, uh, okay, this is what we're going to do. It, you know, absent congressional approval or a bill, and even Congress does pass a bill, and they say they're not going to enforce it. Look at what the AG is doing in a number of places. It's very, very concerning. That's on the domestic side. Now flip it over on the foreign policy side, Mm -hmm. and what do you get? Ambivalence, an ambiguous policy, somebody who's absent from making decisions. It's just the opposite. I mean, it's amazing, you know? Yeah, I think uh, I think Charles Krauthammer last night called it uh, uh, marble mouth p- diplomacy. Exactly. I think that, that's I mean, what he called it. When it comes it. to foreign policy, I I have to say I'll tell you sort of a, a cute story. I I happened to to attend a party. It was it was last summer. It was during the campaign season, uh, and it was out in California. Uh-huh. And um, Chris Christie was there, okay, and 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 he. This is a private party. He was making remarks, and it was a private party. And 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 he's he's a very charming man. He's a very bright guy, former prosecutor, and all the rest of it. We know that, very bright guy. And he made a comment about Obama that I thought was. I, I remembered the line because it was interesting. What he said was, he said, you know, I feel sorry for Obama because he doesn't know what he doesn't know. He's a man fumbling in the dark, searching for the light switch of leadership. I think I heard that quote. I think he's used that before. I thought that was a uh, yeah. great quote, looking for the light switch of leadership. Yeah. I know. I, I, think about it. When you think about foreign policy, doesn't that fit? Yeah. And he said that a year ago. When I was a little kid, about three years old, I am. Um, my mom and I lived with my grandparents in New Jersey, and there were numerous times... When I was, I guess I was probably three years old or so, when I'd get up in the middle of the night mm-hmm. to go to the bathroom, and I got lost in my bedroom and couldn't find the light switch. Exactly. And I had to figure out exact. <laughs> I had to figure out on my own when I was like three years old how to go along the wall until I found that light switch. Sometimes it took me exactly. a long time to find that light switch too. Well, um, there you go. Uh, no, but that's um, you know, I mean, I kind of like Chris Christie. I mean. You know, ups and downs here and there, but I mean, I think yeah. the man is very smart, and uh, you know, he's got some. That was a pretty good line, yeah. and I like it, and I think he's going to be elected, reelected overwhelmingly in a, the bluest of blue states, which is quite an achievement when you think about it. You know, and every it's single really person on this planet has problems that other people don't like. You know, the guy took a walk. You know. I don't care how much butt he had to kiss of Obama's to get the money for the people in his state after Hurricane Sandy. If he wants to take a walk on the beach with Obama to get that money, I really don't care. You know, his primary concern is taking care of those people. The point is you have to look at results, and the results of his governorship are are quite impressive. His work with the unions, his work with, you know, all the people there. He's doing a pretty good job. I have a son, as I mentioned earlier, that lives in New Jersey, and they love him back there. They really do. And I just think that he's um, he's done a good job, a very challenging job, and I hope he runs in 2016. I, I think he could be a very interesting candidate. Yes, he we'll, could. We'll see how it goes. But so. he's, he's focusing on the major issues, you know, the economy and jobs and that sort of thing. And when you think about economy and jobs, oh, my gosh. Um, you know, I, I saw some numbers that I was going to um, share with you just about some of the things that have gone on with, uh, you know, comparing Reagan with Obama, you know, it's unbelievable with uh, some of the things that, you know, that Obama says that he wants to help uh, the, say, the people that are, are the poorest and all that sort of thing. But his policies have acted actually hurt them the most. Uh, Let me give you a couple of numbers. Um, When Reagan cut taxes across the board for everybody, lower down, middle, higher, job creators, everybody, uh, we all know there was an incredible reaction. We finally, when they kicked in, we had 3% growth, 4%, and finally even 7% growth in GDP, whereas right now it's it's absolutely anemic, worst worst recovery in, in, uh, in 80 years. But here are a couple of numbers. Under Reagan, black adult unemployment fell by 20%. 
under Obama, it has increased by 42%. Under Reagan, black teenage unemployment fell by 16%. Under Obama, get this number, black teenage unemployment has increased by 56%. And under Obama, labor force participation has fallen for all groups. And uh, the trouble is Obama claims to have created jobs, but we know that most are part-time jobs and millions of others are unemployed or giving up. And under Reagan, depending on when you start counting, a rough number of jobs created was something around 18 million. And many were women-owned businesses. So you have to look at what works and what doesn't work. And what Reagan did worked not only for his years in office, but it continued on, even even on through the Clinton years. Uh, and what Obama's doing, unfortunately, is hurting the least among us, and it's very, very sad. It is um, very sad. My uh, my wife has actually been unemployed since uh, right around 2008, and uh-huh. she's um, she was taking care of her mother for a couple of years because her mother is uh, uh-huh. she's in a nursing home now, but. Um, I mean, she hasn't been able to find anything. There's nothing out there. Uh, I'm lucky myself. Well, it's, I it's still very have a full-time hard. job. It's, you know, part-time jobs and things. But, no, it's very, very, very hard. And I, 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 I know that. And the kind of things that we need to create more jobs um, is, is, of course, uh, you know, some definition of what <laughs> the future, not all this doubt that, 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 that's going on. And if, if we had a cut, in tax rates across the board, you know, for job creators especially, if we lowered our corporate tax rate, con- companies could come back here rather than being overseas. Many of them could. Uh, they've already said that. Um, if we cut the capital gains tax rate and, uh, you know, that sort of thing, just look at the states where they've done that, and those are the states that are doing well, Texas, Florida, you know, others, and the states that keep raising taxes, everybody's moving out. Who yeah. wants to stay there? I mean, it's perfectly obvious. So if the government, this government, of course, you're not going to do that, but if they could just <laughs> understand, as I said, what works and what doesn't work, um, I think we could get this economy back on track. But right now, we are on the wrong track, and it's very, very upsetting for me and everybody else, I'm sure. Do you remember back in 2008 when, uh, after Obama was uh, elected, before he was uh, immaculated into office, they, um, there was a big uh, debate over Keynesian economics that Obama was planning oh, yeah. to use. And he, uh, yeah, uh, Keynesian's great. You know, Ken, Keynesian's the way to go. Mm-hmm. And we can see the failure of it all over the place. On the screen right now, I am looking at, um, I'm at the American Thinker, and I have uh, four charts up um, uh, comparing Reagan to Obama, and it is just so, so stark. I mean, the the labor mm-hmm. participation par- participation fo- um, rate is uh, Obama's goes literally straight down. Mm-hmm. And it's I know it's, oh, it's just so frustrating. Help me feel help me feel better well, about I'll this. I'll tell you what, Bill. It's it's really good to chat with you about these things, and mm-hmm. I'm glad that you're calling attention to them uh, with your show. And as we mentioned at the top of the show, if anybody has any questions, if they would like to um, maybe get in touch or something, they could shoot me an email through the website, which is com. I'd love to hear from them. That would really be terrific. And if they want to you know, pick up a copy of my latest book, Castle Bravo, that would be a lot of fun, too. I think it would really be great. And, um, you know, I wish you well. I think that uh, you're doing a good job. Thank and you. And I hope that you keep up with your show. Um, yes, and uh, when your next book comes out, hopefully we can rebook you to um, come on the show again. There you go. I would look forward to it. Well, listen, it's been great chatting with you. I have to uh, get ready for another event here, but uh, thanks so much right. for having me on. It's always good to chat about these things and hope for the future for this great American country we have here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Bill. Bye. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was our guest, Karna Bodman. She has uh, another event to get to. I, I let the uh, time get away from me a little bit here while we were uh, listening to her. But I think what I'm going to do is for the uh, rest of the show here, for uh, those of you that are listening, I am going to play some uh, clips from Ronald Reagan to end the show. 
and um, we'll go ahead and uh, listen to them together. Um, let me see here. What ones do I have? I have... Um, I'll go over them real quick. Uh, we're going to... Uh, part of his Berlin speech, the speech in Berlin. Um, then he's going to talk about the Constitution, the deficit, uh, trading freedom for security, the full power of the central government, uh, James Madison, uh, 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 socialized health care, uh, the revolution, uh, removing farmers, and he actually talks about Agenda 21 in that one. So I'm going to play these right now, and then we're going to go ahead and end the show. Here we go. We come to Berlin, we American presidents, because it's our duty to speak in this place of freedom. Our gathering today is being broadcast throughout Western Europe and North America. I understand that it is being seen and heard as well in the East. To those listening throughout Eastern Europe, I extend my warmest greetings and the goodwill of the American people. Behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of this city, part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. From the Baltic South, those barriers cut across Germany in a gash of barbed wire, concrete, dog runs, and guard towers. Standing before the Brandenburg Gate, every man is a German separated from his fellow men. Today I say as long as this gate is closed, as long as this scar of a wall is permitted to stand, it is not the German question alone that remains open, that just as truth can flourish only when the journalist is given freedom of speech, so prosperity can come about only when the farmer and businessman enjoy economic freedom. In the communist world, we see failure, technological backwardness, declining standards of health, now the Soviets themselves may, in a limited way, be coming to understand the importance of freedom. We hear much from Moscow about a new policy of reform and openness. Are these the beginnings of profound changes in the Soviet state, or are they token gestures intended to raise false hopes in the West or to strengthen the Soviet system without changing it? We welcome change and openness, for we believe that freedom and security go together, that the advance of human liberty, the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, Tear down this wall. We were told a few days ago by the president we must accept a greater government activity in the affairs of the people. But they've been a little more explicit in the past. And among themselves, and all of the things I now will quote have appeared in print, these are not Republican accusations. For example, they have voices that say, profit motive has become outmoded, it must be replaced by the incentives of the welfare state. Or our traditional system of individual freedom is incapable of solving the complex problems of the 20th century. Senator Fulbright, has said at Stanford University that the Constitution is outmoded. He referred to the president as our moral teacher and our leader, and he says he is hobbled in his task by the restrictions of power imposed on him by this antiquated document. He must be freed so that he can do for us what he knows is best. No nation in history has ever survived a tax burden that reached a third of its national income. Today, 37 cents out of every dollar earned in this country is the tax collector's share. 
And yet our government continues to spend $17 million a day more than the government takes in. We haven't balanced our budget 28 out of the last 34 years. We've raised our debt limit three times in the last 12 months. And now our national debt is one and a half times bigger than all the combined debts of all the nations of the world. We have $15 billion in gold in our treasury. We don't own an ounce. Foreign dollar claims are $27.3 billion. And we've just had announced that the dollar of 1939 will now purchase 45 cents in its total value. This idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. You and I are told increasingly we have to choose between a left or right. Well, I'd like to suggest there is no such thing as a left or right. There's only an up or down. Man's own old age dream, the ultimate in individual freedom consistent with law and order, or down to the ant heap of totalitarianism. And regardless of their sincerity, their humanitarian motives, those who would trade our freedom for security have embarked on this downward course. Another articulate spokesman defines liberalism as meeting the material needs of the masses through the full power of centralized government. Well, I for one resent it when a representative of the people refers to you and me, the free men and women of this country, as the masses. This is a term we haven't applied to ourselves in America. But beyond that, the full power of centralized government, this was the very thing the founding fathers sought to minimize. They knew that governments don't control things, a government can't control the economy without controlling people. And they know when a government sets out to do that, it must use force and coercion to achieve its purpose. James Madison in 1788, speaking to the Virginia Convention, said, Since the general civilization of mankind, I believe there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachment of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. Back in 1927, an American socialist, Norman Thomas, six times candidate for president on the Socialist Party ticket, said the American people would never vote for socialism. But he said under the name of liberalism, the American people will adopt every fragment of the socialist program. One of the traditional methods of imposing statism or socialism on a people has been by way of medicine. It's very easy to disguise a medical program as a humanitarian project. Most people are a little reluctant to oppose anything that suggests medical care for people who possibly can't afford it. Now, the American people, if you put it to them about socialized medicine and gave them a chance to choose, would unhesitatingly vote against it. We had an example of this. Under the Truman administration, it was proposed that we have a compulsory health insurance program for all people in the United States, and of course, the American people unhesitatingly rejected this. In this country of ours took place the greatest revolution that has ever taken place in world's history, the only true revolution. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another. But here, for the first time in all the thousands of years of man's relation to man, a little group of men, the Founding Fathers, for the first time, established the idea that you and I had within ourselves the God-given right and ability to determine our own destiny. This freedom was built into our government with safeguards. We talk democracy today, and strangely we let democracy begin to assume the aspect of majority rule is all that is needed. Well, majority rule is a fine aspect of democracy, provided there are guarantees written in. They've also... And that was some uh, audio clips from Ronald Reagan. Uh, let's listen. Let's listen. This is going to be the last clip about what Ronald Reagan says about Agenda 21. Actually, there's two clips. I'm going to play two clips here. Hold on one second. Here's what he says about Agenda 21. They've also asked for the right to imprison farmers who wouldn't keep books as prescribed by the federal government. The Secretary of Agriculture asked for the right to seize farms through condemnation and resell them to other individuals. And contained in that same program was a provision that would have allowed the federal government to remove two million farmers from the soil. And here is another Ronald Reagan clip 
about Agenda 21. Meanwhile, back in the city, under urban renewal, the assault on freedom carries on. Private property rights so diluted that public interest is almost anything a few government planners decide it should be. In a program that takes from the needy and gives to the greedy, for three decades we've sought to solve the problems of unemployment through government planning, and the more the plans fail, the more the planners plan. They've just declared Rice County, Kansas, a depressed area. Rice County, Kansas has 200 oil wells, and the 14,000 people there have over $30 million on deposit in personal savings in their banks. And when the government tells you you're depressed, lie down and be depressed. We have so many people who can't see a fat man standing beside a thin one without coming to the conclusion the fat man got that way by taking advantage of the thin one. So they're going to solve all the problems of human misery through government and government planning. Well, now, if government planning and welfare had the answer, and they've had almost 30 years of it, shouldn't we expect government to read the score to us once in a while? Shouldn't they be telling us about the decline each year in the number of people needing help? But the reverse is true. Each year, the need grows greater. The program grows greater. We were told four years ago that 17 million people went to bed hungry each night. Well, that was probably true. They were all on a diet. <laughs> But now we're told that 9.3 million families in this country are poverty-stricken on the basis of earning less than $3,000 a year. Welfare spending 10 times greater than it was in the dark depths of the Depression. We're spending $45 billion on welfare. Now do a little arithmetic and you'll find that if we divided the $45 billion up equally among those 9 million poor families, we'd be able to give each family $4,600 a year. And this added to their present income should eliminate poverty. And there you go. There's some words of wisdom from Ronald Reagan. And that about does it for this episode of Surrounded by Idiots. We will see everybody next week on Wednesday. And uh, perhaps we'll have a show before then. Uh, have a good night. Thank you for stopping by. And don't forget to remember those who have fallen on September 11th. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. 